Hi, my name is Pat Ryan. Welcome to Chicago Founder Stories here at 1871, Chicago's new digital startup hub. We have a great story for you tonight. Uh, Jay Shikawa from uh, Field Glass, founder and uh, CEO of Field Glass, uh, here with us tonight. Welcome, Jay. Glad to have you. Thank you. Um, so, Jay, I've, I've heard many people say that you have the, built the greatest company most people don't know. You and I have been friends for a number of years. We met on a Thai cruise, I think, about five or seven years ago uh, with the Indus Entrepreneurs. But, I, you know, even I was blown away when you had uh, the $220 million event with Madison Dearborn. And, uh, you know, I don't think anybody understood the scale of what you guys had built. It's a really exciting story. And my understanding is that the company is, you know, multiples bigger than then. So this is going to be a great story to share. Thank you for being here. Thank you for sharing it, and uh, and it's great because B2B is hot, but in Chicago, if you don't buy from the company, you don't know, so this is going to be great. For people who don't know Field Glass, what would, how would you describe what you do, what your core value proposition and market is? So I think the, the best way to describe what we do, uh, I'll, I'll describe it in two parts. So the platform itself is a cloud platform, and it's a software as a service cloud platform, so as I think most people know, it's a... It's a single tenant that serves many customers, so you avoid the proliferation of code bases. So that's the platform. The problem we solve. So you're an early cloud company because you founded this, what, 99? Two, yeah, 2000, 2000? approximately. And the, yeah. the term cloud wasn't even used there. In fact, a, a couple of years after we founded it, the term ASP, application yeah. service software sure. provider, started You were an ASP, I remember, yes. Nobody uses it anymore. Nobody uses it because it's not, it's not a good word anymore. It uh, ties people too tightly to the the proprietary products here. And the term cloud is more recent, but that's in fact what we were doing. And that's, uh, we never thought of it that way. It just seemed like the, the better way to do things. So what problem are you solving for a company? Like what kind of companies do you serve and what problem are you solving for them? So our typical customer is a very large firm, someone like a Citibank or a GlaxoSmithKline, one of these big multinationals who have very large quantities of uh, what we call non-employee labor. So either contract labor or consultants and uh, it becomes a very big problem because you know even a lot of the people in this room and others, when they look for careers at large companies, they won't automatically step up and say, I want a full-time job for the rest of my life. They'll say, they'll think in terms of projects or even gigs, you know, that looks like an interesting project. I think I'll do that for nine months. And you multiply that by lots and lots of people and you have yourself a very large, essentially invisible problem at these firms. It's interesting. And so... <clears throat> What's your scale right now? Like, what can you tell us about how big how big your company is today? Uh, some of the metrics. So, you know, in terms of some of the metrics, we have about three hundred and fifty full time headcount, and that's spread out uh, you know, across the world. Most of them are in Chicago, maybe a couple of hundred. But we've got a presence in London, where we serve Europe, uh, in Australia, and in India. Uh, we'll probably we'll hire one hundred and twenty five people this year. We hired one hundred and twenty five this year. This year, we hired wow. a hundred last year. Wow. How many in Chicago? Yes. Uh, I'd say 75% of them wow. are and will be in Chicago. So we have also essentially run out of space now. <laughs> I was looking with interest at the very large empty spot down the hallway on the, on the right <laughs> side. So somebody, Love to have wants, you as a neighbor. somebody wants to cut us a deal, you know, we're, we're open for, for debate. So <clears throat> that's one metric. The other metric is the amount of uh, spend that runs through the system and it's uh, somewhere in the range of 21 to 22 billion a year. Billion with a B? With a B, yes. Wow. With a B. That's incredible. Uh, and we get paid a very tiny fraction of that as our fees. Uh, that's, that's another element of scale. In terms of customers, <coughs> maybe about 250 customers. They tend to be very large firms of the type I mentioned. And you know, the bigger they are, the more complex their issues, the better of a, of a fit we become. That's great. Well, Everybody knows about your big $220 million transaction. Obviously, the company's grown multiple times since then. <clears throat> one of the great Chicago success stories and one of the great exciting B2B success stories. But, you know, people listen to the story now and you, you look at where you ended up, and it probably seems obvious to people who are just looking now that that's a problem to have been solved and, and how you solve it. Um, but in 2000, probably wasn't so obvious. So how did you get the idea? Where did the idea and how, where did the company come from? So this is an uh, interesting discussion. I'll try to frame it in, in terms that are more generally useful. So what I discovered early, so maybe I can take a step back. Before I did this, uh, there were other ideas that me and a, you know, a couple of friends tried to pursue. 
and uh, we found that it's it's not enough just to be interested in a subject. Uh, you have to have a reason. You have to have a reason so, so to be. Give, give us an example of like what was the first idea you pursued together? Uh, so the one that sticks out of my mind, uh, so I was at the, the McKinsey at the time, so a very good friend of mine who was a doctor. We decided that the world needed a different form of you know, medical service delivery, and it's a combination of Eastern and Western holistic medicine. It was a great idea. We didn't have any idea how we would actually execute on it, but you know, at that point, it's fun over a couple of beers. You work out, work out a business plan. And my best ideas are over a couple of beers. <laughs> That's what ideas will get you. It's a, it's, a, you know, it's, a, it's a long journey from there to exactly. actually commercializing a you know, model, let alone becoming a company. And our seminal moment, and we had spent some cycles on this. We tra traveled around. We were sitting with a very senior doctor who was experienced in the field, and he listens to our pitch. What did you know about the field going into this? Let's not get into that. Not much, actually. That was, that was, that was, Quite interested. I had once been treated by a holistic medicine specialist. Okay. Uh, I knew a little bit more, but not 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 that much. My friend was a doctor, so we relied on that. We do, you know, we had sort of business school skills, which right. turned out to be not enough, as you discover. But that doctor sat sat us down, and he said, "You guys are puppies. Puppies. You're going to get killed." Seems right. I'm sure you're yeah. a little offended at first, but we were uh, we were offended. But then, upon rumination, <laughs> it turned out that he was exactly right. Yeah. So we had the good sense to stop that journey before we, in fact, did get killed. But he was right. And the lesson I took away is, you have to ask yourself, what gives you the right to start a company? What gives you the right to ask investors for money? What gives you the right right to recruit anybody to your idea and waste their time and their lives? Right? You have to have a good answer for that. It's a profound way of looking at it. What gives you the right? So, obviously, something gave you the right to field glass. So, talk about that. So, uh, what we thought, you know, I frame it this way with the benefit of hindsight. Back then, I would have disputed this, <laughs> this piece of wisdom. <laughs> but I had lived in all parts of this space for a few years. So, I knew the life of the, the contract worker. What, uh, what had you done as a contract worker? I had uh, written poor quality COBOL code. So you were a coder? I was. And you worked as a contractor coder? I was. So that is where, how I came Where were you doing that? I was with one of the subsidiaries of uh, the Borrowers Corporation, which then became Unisys. So they brought me in as a COBOL. This was the wave of you know, young techie immigration back then from, from India, where I grew up. And what year was that? This was a, a while back. <laughs> <laughs> so this was in uh, 80, late 85, 86. So you come over as a contractor. Little did you know that would be the great vision to build the billion dollar company. It was years before it became a vision. Mostly it was, it was a fun experience. You know, you had gigs, you filled in, you know, timesheets, and you, you got paid some. But then I ended up at a firm called Sintel, which was, uh, which was on the supply side. It was an IT mm -hmm. services provider started by uh, uh, a, a man, and a gentleman and his wife, Bharat and Mirja, who turned out to be tremendously successful entrepreneurs. So I learned a lot from them. But I understood life on the supply side. And then at, at McKinsey, years later, I understood life on the side of the buyer. So mm -hmm. it gave me a 360-degree picture of this space. Mm -hmm. So when I finally began it, uh, you know, it, you have to, uh, the term I always use is you have to let yourself marinate. That's well put. I love that. In the space for a I while. Uh, and unless you do that, the, the space will not reveal its insights to you. And it will not reveal its true problems to you. I think that's an interesting one. You know, there's this, there's a tendency, and I, I'm on the Chicago Ventures um, uh, investment committee, and you know, I see a lot of companies, a lot of smart people, but I can't help but think to myself, what do they really understand about this, and how expensive if they don't understand it from the inside out, how expensive will it be for them to learn it? Right. And you know, I was listening to Chris Dixon the other day, and he said he was talking about uh, Peter Thiel's great comment about. The, the entrepreneurs, when he looks at his portfolio, he's now at Andreessen Horowitz, who was one of the great New York um, angels, and he said, angel investors, and he said, you know, if you look at the companies that do best, the founder had a secret. It was something that they saw about the opportunity in that market that was contrary to what other people saw, but it wasn't just an opinion. They had earned it, like you're right. Like you're right. 
they had earned it by being in that uh, space and industry, and it had been revealed to them by earning it. Right. And I think that's really profound insight. And I think it's hard because ideas are so exciting, but um, you know, it's it, it, that's I think that's a really profound insight. So it's serendipitous because obviously you didn't plan your career around triangulating no. the field glass. No. Um, but you really saw it. So when you first saw it together, what gave you the conviction that this was the right one? Like how did that how did that come together? I think what what happens is if you think of a space or a problem deeply enough, mm -hmm. and the real secret here is it's not about the idea or the product, it's about the problem. That's great. If you don't feel like you want to own this problem, this is my problem, nobody mm -hmm. else's. You have to have that feeling of ownership that uh, this is my problem to solve. Mm -hmm. When you start thinking of a problem like that, like you are going to bed with it, you're waking up with it, you are, you are waking up at 2 a.m. thinking about that problem, not about the product, but about the problem. And it's the dissection of the problem and, and letting your mind go through all of the possibilities. You're talking to people about it. You become a tremendous bore at parties. <laughs> Because that's all you can think I about. I started that way. So when I got into problems, it was at least I had a, a good benefit, side benefit. Well, the side benefit is you end up attracting people who actually want to talk about that stuff. Right. So you end up with a very limited set of friends, but, a, but great insights about the idea. Yep. That's when you know you should, you should start. Yeah. I think that's, I think that's really wise enough to say the, uh, you, know, you, you can't help but say, if you look at people who really, the great companies you see built, my first company, I didn't really love the problem. And we, right. it took us a while to be successful. Because of it. we never, you know, it was, it was we were successful, but it was hard to get there. The second business, we really are excited about the problem. We're focused on. It's been very it, it, in our, you know, we ultimately the first business was successful, but the second business in three years where we were, were in five or six, right, the first time. And you see the power of that. Now the problem is, I'll be driving and my wife will look at me and say, "What are you thinking about right now?" And she'll know it's about the problem and how we solve it. Right. And it's. But if you don't have that, I think it's very hard to build anything great because you can't disrupt the world without being completely immersed in it. You do. Yeah, exactly right. Because someone out there will be, and right. you're going to lose to them. That's exactly, I think you're exactly right. And Marin, I like Marinade. That's a good metaphor. So let's go back in time. So you said you came to the U.S. in the 80, late 85. Um, so talk about growing up. You grew up in India. Talk a little bit about that and the formative experiences in your life before you came over. So I grew up in a naval family, in a Navy family. So my father was a was a naval officer. He went on to become a very senior naval officer. I think your, the, your father ran the Indian Navy, I think, he, right? He was the chief of the Indian Navy. I think yeah. the term ran may not apply because okay. <laughs> it's a it's a post, but yes, he did go on to become the chief of the Navy. So cool. I think the, the, the elements of you know, my existence involved a lot of moving around. So we lived in all the coastal towns in India. We lived India had a had a, a military relationship with the old Soviet Union, so we ended up living in in Russia and Vladivostok and so on. So well, let, me ask you, let me ask you a question about that because one of the um, one of my uh, favorite um, ideas I've heard recently. I'm you know I'm always watching interesting talks and things, and I just can't help but the great thinkers just so intriguing and, and add so much to what you what you look at and think about. Listen to a guy the other day who said. You know, if you want to really be an innovator and you want to continue to keep your innovation DNA alive, be a tourist everywhere you go. Be a, be, you know, explore, be a traveler. Experience everything you see, even in your own community. He said what happens is the reason, the reason why people as they get older become less innovative isn't because their brain, they actually have more data points to be more innovative. It's that they start to tune things out and take, you know, have a per certain view of the world. They take them for granted. Yeah, so talk a little bit about, I mean, it's an unusual background for anybody of our generation, let alone for someone in India. Right. Talk a little bit about, you know, do you think that that gave you an ability to understand and perceive things? I mean, you, you had to learn new things all the time, new worlds all the time, new, new communities all the time. And I know how diverse India is. Right. So do you, how was that for you, and do you think that maybe helped you in, in developing entrepreneurial skills in an unusual way? Uh, until this moment, I didn't think about that, but I'm adding that to the to the storyline now. Yes, I did. <laughs> so, but uh, uh, you know, in, in in hindsight, it did because it's uh, it's difficult for a kid to get yanked out of school every couple of years, and like you said, India is 
it is very diverse. So if you move around the country, you'll encounter different languages, different cultures, different foods, different, you know, everything. So it's almost like moving to a different country. So we lived in the south where nobody spoke Hindi, and we lived in the north where nobody spoke, you know, Telugu and you know, so on. So English became the common thread. But you also, you became adaptable. I think that's what happened. You became adaptable, you became, you become curious. So travel, you know, even for a child, will expand their mind in ways that they don't even understand. So I, so I just became open to new experiences, I think. It might be a stretch to somehow connect it up to my... Well, but you're always, when you have to, they, his, his traveler example is, that when you're a traveler, think about going to a country or a city you've never been to. Your, your eyes and ears are more awake, alive. Right. You're noticing the contrast with your own area you're from. And so the more unusual it is, the more you're basically just observing, and you are acutely aware, right? right. And, that, uh, and the comment was that when you're acutely aware of all that's going on, you take more in. Where, you know, you think about commuting to work, I don't even remember how I commuted to work today. It was the right. same way every day. I don't remember anything from it because your brain kind of tunes it out. And I think that's the idea is that it's true. That acute awareness really is a wonderful skill to have as an innovator. It's true. It's very true. Uh, a very uh, rel a relatively simple way to actually cultivate that is to is to think about business models and why different types of companies succeed and why they fail. I think before anyone starts anything, understanding why things have succeeded, why things have failed, you know, thinking through the truths. What is the truth of other business models? Mm -hmm. You know, why did, you, you look at the big success stories like in Amazon and you know, Microsoft and others, none of them were the first in their field at what they did. Mm -hmm. And in a sense, Field Glass was not first in its field. I'm not making any comparison here, but it's always, it's often the fast follower, not the, not the person who began uh, that, that succeeds. Mm -hmm. eBay was not the first. Uh, auction house. I think it was a firm called On Sale that you know, Jerry, if you remember Jerry Kaplan, who had. Yeah, sure. Uh, and there were many others, but eBay succeeded, right? So, so was there a, um, one of the things like that as founders, especially in a long journey, is, and by the way, part of the point of founder stories is to make these more like case studies of right. what you've done rather than just the PR tour. Um, because you learn so much more about that can help you understand how to build a great company and you always learn. You always learn the most from the hard ones. So right. what was the hardest time? Was there you know, a time of where there was most doubt or most challenge? Or what was the hardest time that you had in, in building Field Glass? And tell us a little bit about that and maybe and how you sort of overcame it, both as you and as a company. I think the hardest time was uh, the first four to six years. It lasted a long time. And the reason was that we started at a very bad time in the, in the B2B space and the internet space. So people were skeptical, they'd gotten burnt, and anything B2B had a bad name. So you know, we changed our name right off the bat. We, were, we had a different name, we had a B2B name. What was your name? It's called B2B People. Don't laugh, it seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> <laughs> it's that what we did. But, so uh, how'd you make it through that time? Uh, well, by the way, we, we launched our first B2B business on Washington, D.C. to a group of customers at 10 a.m. on September the 11th, 2001. So we went through, you know, venture guys called that nuclear winter. And it felt like that from selling product. So I totally understand. It was a difficult time. Brutal. I think we had a couple of things that got us through. One is we had a tremendous focus on sharpening the value proposition for our target customer. We did not deviate from who the target customer was. So we told ourselves it had to be a large firm with a, with a, with a big contract labor problem. And... Uh, we did not sell to the mid-market or the, to small firms. So there was that focus. There was a focus on getting the, the product right. And then just on uh, cost management and making sure that we just, you know, we didn't run out of money. So we were essentially, uh, we were doing, investing enough to live to fight another day. Mm -hmm. And I think in about six years, the market turned uh, back to where this type of solution really found its own. So talk about those early years, because one of the things I love to talk about here is product market fit. You know, it's, it's this idea, when you and I started, they didn't call it that. And it took me a while to learn. I learned it the hard way. But you know, nothing's more important than that moment at which your product really starts to resonate with people when they start to pick it up. I remember we went from one year where we were in trouble selling, and we went to a trade show, and we were like the bell of the ball. Everything was packed. And you, it's amazing when you look at it and you say, wow, this is, you know, it's like a light switch flip, but you work so hard iterate so much. So talk about when you didn't have it and, and what you did to, to really nail it. 
So I'll tell you, one of the hardest things to do in the B2B space, and maybe even the B2C space, the B2C space is in some ways even more difficult because you, you don't get to see the customers that much. Mm -hmm. But in the B2B space, once you've written up your business plan and created a sketch of a product, it becomes incredibly difficult to, to actually create the right product. I mean, you can write code and you know, you'll have something that works, but do you, of your laundry list of features and capabilities, what do you pick? Mm -hmm. You pick slightly wrong and you're off course. And that happened in our space and we saw people do the wrong things. Uh, the other thing you realize is that your product is actually forcing its way into a, into a rather crowded landscape of other products. So for instance, your product, our product in this case, might have a timesheet capability built in or an expense management capability built in. But when you look at the marketplace, there are standalone companies doing that, quite big and quite successful. So you have to ask yourself, should I build it or should I leverage one of those? Mm -hmm. It's a big decision and there's no obvious answer, but you have to stare at the, you have to stare at the underlying you know, factors and make some decision. The thing that we did in order to do this is, uh, I meant to mention this earlier, but I decided to do informational interviews before mm -hmm. we wrote a single line of code. Great idea. With uh, potential customers or even you know, people who knew the space. And I would call in through you know, the Kellogg you know, connections or the McKinsey connections. And it was quite easy to get 15, 20 minutes of people's time if you're not selling them anything. And uh, you know, in fact, I found that people were quite generous with their time because they were flattered that you were asking for their views as opposed to for their money. Right. Usually it's the latter, never the former. And some of these conversations became, you know, and I would, I would take them through a guided, you know, set of questions. And the idea was to shed light on our own blind spots. Mm -hmm. And from those discussions, I did, I think, 50 of those, almost 50 of those, maybe more. And there was a body of notes that ended up forming the basis of our strategy, our pricing models. Uh, there were little insights into functionality, you know, et cetera. So, I would recommend that as a good approach. So, so let's 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 break that down for a minute because both here tonight you have people who are entrepreneurs who want to build a great company that love to, to do what you've done. The people who watch this online later don't get the pizza and beer, but they get the great insights. Um, and so, talk a little bit about the how you did that. You, you and I talked about this the other day, and you know the blueprint of how you did that because lots of people, a lot of people talk to others and say, well, what do you think? What you know? But I think the process you use is really interesting and it's quite a blueprint. So It was a structured to, process. Yeah. Yes. So, exactly. So the mistake would be to just go in and say, I want to talk to you about this and it becomes this loose, unstructured discussion. Uh, nothing or you, comes Or you up. just start with talking about your idea. About your idea, which is the worst thing you can do because nobody is actually interested in your idea. They're interested in their problem. Well, this is the problem. You're talking about your product. You're obsessing the product instead of the problem. Instead of the problem. But if you've been at this point thinking about the problem, then you have an interested audience. And the approach we took is, uh, I wrote up a two-page document describing, it was a very sort of a, sort of a consulting type document, but it described the situation mm -hmm. as I saw it, their world, you know, you've got a messy contract labor workforce, uh, Maverick spend, whatever the thing is. So like, you know, do it for just a second. So you walk in and you've got a way of describing their problem. Right. So like you, you, you come to me and you say, um, I've heard people have this problem, and we, we talk about this, think about this. Did you, did you let them just talk then, or how, how did it work? We would, I would actually put the document in front of them, okay. or send it to them ahead of time, and ask okay. them to go through it mm -hmm. and uh, react to it. And they would, they would react to it. They would say, yes, that's us, or that's not us, but a little bit of you know, this. And so when you're done with that discussion, your document has become tighter, and you've developed new insight and new notes. And you've actually made a friend and someone you can call later. So, you know, a couple of those people became our customers years later. That's great. And so did you iterate the way you described it over time? It started to iterate and it became longer. So the, you keep your one or two pager you know, constant, but there's a body of work that starts to develop you know, okay. beyond it. So first is the problem. You get them talking about the problem. How long could you get them talking about the problem usually? You know, I would ask for 15, 20 minutes. Often went, often went longer. And then at what point did you, at some point along the way, did you sort of say, what if? It's implied, you know, it's implied. And uh, or did you offer a value proposition? What if someone had this? Would you, would you be interested in that? Would that help solve your problem? Or did you leave that to later? We left that, you know, we left that to later. Sometimes it just comes naturally as a, as a result of it. 
But uh, I mean, the key here is you are selling before you have product. You're selling something. You're mm -hmm. selling your own credibility. You're selling the vision. You're putting your, your it's a fight for mind space, mm -hmm. for mind share. So that person is thinking about this problem and he knows that you have something coming down the pike, maybe six or 12 months and you, you're putting a marker so that you can return to him, mm -hmm. you know, six months from now. No, it makes a lot of sense. It's so let's, let's talk for a minute. So you, you finally, uh, you get your first sale. Talk about your first sale. Who was your first customer and how'd you get your first customer? Our first customer was uh, Verizon, Verizon Wireless. Our second customer was EIG, and our third customer was GlaxoSmithKline. So we had three big ones right off the bat. And what was it that got you that first customer? Uh, it was because nobody <laughs> wants, you know, only after you're successful they want to hear the first customer. Because if you're in a big company in the middle management, you come back and say, "How many customers do they have?" and you say zero, right? Right? It's a little risky to your career. Right. The the first, you know, we got lucky, honestly, uh, with the first customer. There was a there was a sales rep. Uh, he wasn't employed by us, but he happened to make a phone call and he you know, got somebody senior and he managed to get a meeting for some reason. I think there was a, some college connection or something like that. It was completely by luck. But when we got there, we saw what their problem was. It was a real problem. And then we swung in into high gear. And uh, you know, there, was a, there was an individual there who had a very specific accrual problem. It was an accrual reporting problem. We didn't even understand it fully, but we committed to doing it. Hmm. And uh, her contention was, if you can solve this particular problem for me, I'll give you guys a shot. And you, you've got to find your way to the person who actually has a problem, who's, who's feeling the burr in their saddle you know, every night. Not the person who has a theoretical problem, it's the person who has an actual problem. Right. It's the, uh, it's the old line, people buy pain relievers more than vitamins. Right. Um, all right, so let's talk, so you start growing. You go through the nuclear winter, you, uh, you get your early sales, you start to grab some success. What was the moment or what was the, 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 the time that kind of triggered the growth trajectory that you've been, been on now? I think it was uh, about five years ago. And what happened... After you met me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's... No, I met you right as you were going in. So it's an interesting story because you were talking about, I feel like this is really taking off. And as a fellow entrepreneur, and I liked you, I said, I hope it works out. And the next thing I know this big sale and I thought I missed so much of this story I can't wait to hear it. That's right. So, so Pat missed the lecture between different between causality and coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, I understand. So, so it was about five years ago yeah. and uh, I think there was a perfect storm that took place and there were three things. So people, the large companies stopped believing that one of the incumbent software providers SAP and Oracle or Ariba actually had a solution. People have been telling them that for years but it didn't work so that was one. Second, the, the economy got bad, right? There was a recessionary environment and people suddenly realized we have this big unsolved problem where we can you know, save money. And the third was by then, you know, our sector, which had been chugging along up to this point, had had a lot of success. And so, you know, between those three things, people, the, the space just took off and, you know, we were poised. There were others too, so it became a competitive space. But uh, one of the lessons is you have to stay you know, you have to stay with your idea or your company long enough when the market, you know, achieves ignition around this particular issue. I think that's that's good advice. You know, it's uh, it's interesting. Um, there's an awful lot of you know. There's there's always an interesting paradox of when is pivoting good, like moving or moving away from an idea that's not a good one. On the flip side, you know, to understand if you're ahead of the market, that was really the problem in our first business. We were ahead of the market. And it's painful to wait to be ahead of the market. Right. But uh, nothing more tragic than to have actually been there, paid your dues. And then leave too early. Right. No, that's exactly, I think that's a great, great insight. So talk about scaling. Well, the challenge is, I mean, you hired 125, hired 125 people this year. I hired 100 last year. I mean, you've been scaling incredibly. You're in 78 countries around the world. Yes. Um, talk a little bit about um, how it goes from trying to get somebody to buy a product and figure out how to make that product solve a problem. The next thing you know, you're trying to scale at, at this level when you, uh, you've gotten to it. What are the challenges and what are the lessons learned? Uh, First, about the potholes and ditches, if you don't mind, because I think most people haven't done something like this. Right. Well, we fell, in, we, we fell into a, a number of potholes. You, you just have to fall into one less than the other guy. And so you can crawl out of them. But there, there are all sorts of potholes. We make mistakes. 
you shouldn't sweat the mistakes too much. It's the, I think the mistakes that will kill you are major mistakes of strategy, right, and direction, or major mistakes in the business model, or major product mistakes. If you, if you make some of these, they will, they will be difficult to recover from. You could, you still could, you know, but I. So talk, talk for a minute about what was the, what was the biggest mistake you made when you went to scale? And how did you recover? And what was the what was the best decision you made when you were looking? So one of the big mistakes would be overhired. So what happens is when you raise venture capital, we'd raise thirty eight million in venture capital. The investors are very keen for you to start spending that money, and we did. So there came a point where we overhired, and that was very painful. We had to we had to sort of grow into that space. There was a little bit of you know, trimming to be done, which is very difficult to do. And I I'd recommend. Uh, you know, keep managing cash much better. Cash really is the lifeblood you know, of a company. So that was painful. So we didn't do that again. Then I, then I made a mistake then in the other direction where I raised too much money, in my view. And we raised 38 million, but our bank balance never dropped below 10. And, uh, and so to most people, the idea of raising money seems like a good idea. I got a lot of money, probably a good valuation along with it. Ex break it down for people why that is such a, not just, I mean, people say, well, you raised too much money, but you're describing that as one of your biggest mistakes. So what is it about that? Break it down for people why that's the case, because I think it's, it's not always obvious until they do the math. Right. Uh, well, the raising too little is, you know, it's self-evident that you, you, know, you run out of cash too early and that's a problem. But the raising too much uh, becomes costly if you have a success at the exit. So for instance, uh, if you, as an example, return 5x capital to the investors, and you've raised an extra 10 million. That's 50 million that no longer resides with the company. Right. So you, you and your employee, away. the founders and the employees, just gave 50 million away. Yes, in this in this uh, right. in this particular example, yes, uh, and that's the that's the arithmetic. So, but you know, on balance, this is uh, more art than science. Uh, but there is such a thing as raising too much money. Well, I, I had a friend who did a company, Silicon Energy, and he, uh, that was his one big regret. He, he raised too much money. He had a, he, you know, he, it was a three-year company, a $75 million exit. He'd say, that seems like a good exit. He raised too much money, so he overhired, so they kind of got over their skis. Uh, and then the preferences were so great that what he and his employees took home on a three-year company that sold for $75 million was really quite small. And he said, you know, nobody tells you that when you're raising money. That's true. And uh, I, you know, I have I dislike the idea of early stage investors putting in preferences. You know, I know they do it for their protection, etc. But then it's not a, then it's not a venture investment. You know, there's no venturing taking place. It's, uh, it's not an adventure anymore, and the risks are disproportionately shared. And uh, uh, you know, I'm very much in favor of just having sort of a straight, uh, a, a sort of a straight return, straight preference. You know, the, there's a one x preferred. But when you get into multiples and you know participation, et cetera, it becomes it creates a psychological burden for the entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure investors realize that they're in fact putting their horse in a race with ankle weights, so to say. Interesting. That's a that's a really interesting point. So talk about raising money because you raised money a number of times. You raised 38 million dollars, and then you had the 220 million dollar sailor. Talk a little bit about um, that experience. Like walk us through you know sort of what the different occasions were and, and what were the most interesting stories out of that that you think we're, we're sharing? Uh, it was painful <laughs> back in the day. Now it's a lot easier to raise money in this town, but uh, back when we started and you know you were, you were operating at about that time and there were a few others, if you started a company in Chicago, you got the Midwest haircut on the valuation. If somebody invested in you at all, most of the VCs here were investing on the coasts. And very few people on the coast were even looking at this. So, you know, we we made a lot of trips around, uh, you know, looking for money. And there were a lot of presentations and, you know, eating bad food and cheap hotels, you know, et cetera. I think in the four rounds we raised, we probably pitched to 100 people. Wow. We were essentially rejected by 95 of them. Well, it's, uh, you know, I think it's Bessemer that has the wall of all the people. It's their, it's their uh, what do they call it? 
It's like their anti-portfolio. It's the all the, the one they missed. The ones they missed. Yes. And they they show they have the humility to show it and put it on the wall, which you have to respect in a venture guided way. Here's all the people that we were not as right. smart as we thought we were, and we should have invested in them. That's what gives me comfort. I hope we're out there on a lot. Of these, <laughs> I'm sure you are. A lot of these walls. I'm sure you are. So um, then, a couple years ago, 2010, I think you. Uh, October of 2010. Uh, so we ran a, so I ran a, you know, the, the investors had been in the business for 10 years now, so it starts to get long. That's the duration of the average venture fund. And uh, we ran a process, and I, I began by wanting us as a firm, as a management team, to take control of this process. So I went around with my CFO and met lots of private equity firms, some strategics. And I did that before bringing in bankers. So we, then we did a banker selection. So by the time the banker got involved, I had relationships with lots of people, and you know, and by then it turned out to be a, it was a hot space, you know, SaaS and cloud, and we had good margins, and we were growing at a good clip, and uh, we ended up with uh, 19 offers. It was a very different experience from the previous times fundraising. We narrowed down to four, and uh, you know, I finally understood what an investment banker does. <laughs> so I was a <laughs> skeptic up to that point, but the the good ones do add value. I would actually credit our our particular banker uh, was Archpoint with with creating the last you know ten to fifteen percent of value wow. that, that we got. I hope Doug from MDP is not listening. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, but we selected Madison Dearborn Partners. We just we just found them to be uh, really the best cultural fit for us. You know, people who would be there as advisors but would leave us alone operationally. That's what you had an interesting for. one because. You did something somewhat unusual, which is you got liquidity for your investors, right. but you've kept going. Yes. And uh, you rolled over part of yours, and obviously your management team's there. So you continue on as an entrepreneurial investor, but yes. with fresh investors. It was a it was a very good arrangement because they allowed the team to create you know substantial liquidity, but also rolled we rolled over enough, and then there was a new option pool created, etc. That essentially got the collective back pretty close to where it was. Wow. And uh, you know we knew what we were doing. We were the dominant player in our space, and we continue to be that. So, and this is an exciting, it's an exciting space. Well, it's a great firm, and Doug's yeah. a terrific guy. I mean, just uh, I've introduced him to a few entrepreneurs because, you know, it's uh, it's not that easy to feel comfortable introducing entrepreneurs to someone because it's easy for someone to be friendly when they want your business, right. but what's someone going to be like when you really have to know him? He seems like just a great, he's a good guy. He and I played squash together for years, and. Uh, you know, I think you know this, but uh, I used to treat him as a confidant during this process. Mm -hmm. and he had all your secrets. He had all my secrets. And at one point, he turns on me. He says, wait a minute. You know, you know, these guys, Goldman and you know, Bain bidding on you, these are my competitors. What am I missing here? <laughs> <laughs> I said, you can't turn on me now. You know, the, you, know, exactly. the, you know the secrets. But when they got interested, they moved very quickly. Well, that's great. I'm glad that I'm excited here. He's a great guy, and it's nice to see him. Doing well with it. So let's let's talk a little bit about you know top lessons learned. Uh, before we get we get uh, we'll, we'll get some questions from the crowd here. Top lessons learned. Like if you were to say if I had to do this all over again, if you turned around and founded a company tomorrow, what would be the top one, two, three things that you'd say, boy, I'd really do this? Whether you did it right the first time or got it wrong the first time, like what are they? If you were them, we're going to do this. What would it be? All right, well, that's that's good. So in, in no particular order, I'll I'll think of a few. So. One of the ways I think about a company now is I think of it as, a, as in three parts. So a company, when you're starting off, consists of uh, an idea. And by an idea, I mean the standards of the idea we talked about, which is it has to be sort of a commercially viable you know, idea, not just you know, something you thought of the other day. So a, a commercially viable idea that you're willing to get behind is one. The second is you need a team, so yourself and whoever else, and then you need capital. And my recommendation is that the entrepreneur should not try to bring all three to the table. They're, they're putting their life into it, right? They're putting their blood, sweat, and tears. You should be able to get investors interested in what you're doing. It's the first test of the entrepreneur. If you cannot raise money, or even a little bit of money, and the, 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 the bar is so much lower these days than it used to be, you can start a company with very little, then it's telling you something, there's something wrong. So that's, that's my first takeaway. Even having capital, I would actually still go out and test the market for someone's willingness to back you. So that's one. I'd say the, 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 the second is I would, not, I would not get into a space that I 
hadn't soaked them for for a while. And soaking marinating is a big theme for you. I, I totally agree. I think yes. It's a great point. It's a it's a big theme. Now we all know one or two spaces. What happens if you don't know a space? So there's ways to do it. You know, I described one technique we did, which is just deeply immersing yourself in. This is a great consultant skill. So you know, having spent some time at at McKinsey, I was there for about three years. Uh, you know, just long enough to know the essential skills of a of an entry level consultant. But asking questions and being inquisitive, you can make up a lot of time by doing that. I think you're right. You know, it's funny. Uh, I did a post on this a few months back on founder market fit, and I talked about how Brian Johnson from Braintree, you know, he had been in, he'd been selling that product, and so he really knew it. I talked about Don Killis, founder of Siri. And Doug, uh, you know, he really had gotten into the mobile space early. I mean, in the late 90s, he really got into that. And one of my favorite stories, I don't know the guy, but um, 42 Floors, which is kind of a, it's a, it's an online play for commercial real estate rental. And so the guy has, has this great idea. I've got the great idea. What I'm going to do is I'm going to get, we're going to disrupt commercial real estate brokers. And so he went to Paul Graham. He said, it's inefficient. I don't like it as a consumer. Paul Graham said, you only understand what it's like to be the buyer. You know what it's like to be the seller. And so here's what I want you to do. I will accept you to Y Combinator, but on one condition, you'll get your broker's license and spend six months working as a commercial real estate broker. So he did. He shadowed a broker and, you know, helped him out. And he left the thing saying, wait a second, with all the ways that um, real estate works, fighting the brokers 100% will be a losing battle, especially at this stage. But sellers' brokers are always needing buyers' brokers. Right. And there's money in the buyers' broker side of this deal. Right. So... And sellers' brokers would love to have amplification of their message because they get paid by the, the, the landlord. And so he ended up changing his whole model to build it around being a value to the seller's broker and the market and the uh, consumer or the, the company buying. And changed his whole business. And I thought that that whole marinating idea, that whole soaking it in, I think it's under under heralded, and we don't talk about it as much here as I think they do now in the valley. And I think getting that out is so important because. Your probability of success is so much greater. It's just—it's almost like you're playing the you know, playing craps if you uh, right. don't know it. That's true. So, what else would be your big takeaways? I would say for an entrepreneur, they should know what their right role is at the company. Just because they started it doesn't mean they should be running it. Often, their skills lie on the tech side or the other side. So, having that self-awareness, you know, if you if you don't feel like you want to get up in the morning and go out there and try to sell new deals or raise money, et cetera, then, then maybe you don't want an outward facing role. Maybe your better role is to be you know, the main, you know, the, the main, the, you know, the tech guy or, or mm -hmm. something like that, the main product person. Those are all very good roles. You can still be a founder. And I think the flip side of that is you have to, you have to partner up with someone or a set of people that complement you. So in my case, you know, my, my first two hires, uh, Sean Chow, who's still our CTO and you know, really has most of the firm tree into him, and there was Chris Mortensen, who stayed with us for five or six years. He was head of sales, and I had a head of product. These are your first two hires, somebody to build it and somebody to sell it, whatever it is. And then you, as the founder, decide which side of you know, your skills would you, are Would you in. consider yourself a technical founder? I know you've been a coder, but would you consider yourself a technical founder? No. no. So talk, I would not. There's a lot of talk about the fact that technical founders um, you, know, you have to have a tech, you have to be a technical founder to do this. You founded a great software company. I mean, you, this isn't just a little web page someplace or a service business technology. A service business, this is real technology. So, talk a little bit about the, uh, if you would, about why it wasn't critical for you to be a technical founder, and how you see that in today's landscape. I think it's an advantage to not be a technical founder because your mind doesn't automatically go to product and code, et cetera, which is what the temptation of a technical founder would be. Now, people who are very technical, they find great success either partnering with somebody who can handle the business and the strategy side, or they develop products that are very technical, in fact. There's deep database products and you know, things that work on the inside, and there are plenty of you know, those, those individuals. So it's, it's not a plus or a minus, it's just what you choose to do. In my case, it turned out to be a positive because I had, I was, I, I partnered with someone who knew that space cold. Mm -hmm. you know, he'd probably forgotten more in a day than I'd 
accumulated all the I think that's I think that's really important for Chicago. You know, I heard a guy say the other day that you know Silicon Valley is an infrastructure uh, place. We're at 128 outside of Boston is an infrastructure place. San Francisco, though, the companies there are application companies. It's more innovation through technology. Chicago's an application city. It's an application, yes, it's an application city. And it could be it could be much more. I mean, so many uh, there are lots of exciting things happening here, but most firms here, that is right, they are they are on the applied side. I think that's a, the that's important advice. So let's go into uh, some of the questions from the crowd here. The, the number one ranked question, thank you for voting. Makes my life a lot easier. Uh, what is the thing that allows a first follower to take off? Is it leadership? Is it execution? It's a very good question. A fast, a fast follower. Yes, sir. Uh, it's, it's, so for us, we were the fifth company to start in this space. So it's, it's a bit daunting when that happens. So we were probably not even the fast follower. We were the fast, you know, fifth follower. What allows you to take off is you have to understand why, you have to form a point of view as to why you think the other firm will not succeed in the same way. And unless you can convince yourself why you are differentiated, and differentiated in a protectable way. So you have to have a moat. The Warren Buffett moat. Yeah, the, the Warren Buffett moat, or just something defensible with, that cannot easily be copied. Uh, that's what allows you to succeed, if you can, if you can make that case. And, uh, it's with a little thought, it's not that difficult to do. You can make adjustments, but you have to be able to put all the players on your own you know, XY graph somewhere and convince yourself why or how you will block them, right? what, what you will do. And, uh, and uh, just a follow up to that would be, I think people forget that the moment a company reveals its hand in terms of what it's doing, it also reveals what it is not doing or what it cannot do. Right? And especially when you have big competitors like in our case, Oracle and SAP and so on, they have to telegraph their moves to their customers through their trade shows and the media, et cetera. You know what they're doing. And you want to stay out of the way of exactly what they're doing, but in the crevices, they leave lots and lots of space where young companies can be built. Very Sun Tzu of you with the, uh, let, them, let your opponent reveal its, its uh... In hindsight, yes. Back then it was just... <laughs> <laughs> So when you wake up in the morning, what is it which pulls you out of bed to say your life, say life is worth everything I do? I don't really understand that question exactly, but um, as best you can from what the question says. I got a lot of votes, seven votes. I, so, uh, all right, I, I can draw an inference from that, from that question. This is why do, you, why, why do we still do what we do? And I think it's, it's because uh, in, for us, we have, uh, point of view where we see the, the, the problem that we solve as being meaningful and important on a, very, on a big scale. You know, people get excited by big problems and the thing we're doing is a big problem at a global mm -hmm. level. It is in fact so big that we can't even fathom all the different ways, the, the pathways that the solution will take. I think in many ways we're only at the infancy of solving this. So it makes it exciting. So there's, a, there's an unknown aspect to it, there's a global aspect to it. You know, uh, so it, it remains an exciting problem, and I think it's, it's actually a good question because it's the job of the leadership team to make sure that the problem doesn't get shallow or doesn't appear that it's been solved. Mm -hmm. That's good. I like that. That's great. So what industries really excite you as ripe for disruption? By the way, thank you for all the voting. They're changing all the time. I have to stay on top of this. What so I'll, tell you, I'll tell you the one that really excites me. It's actually the related space of uh, the workforce, employment, how people look for jobs, etc. The reason it excites me is because the incumbencies are under such threat here. So if you look at the way people searched for jobs and conducted jobs, you had, you had uh, you know, agencies and then, then you had the job board and you know, the monsters and others of the world were, it seemed like that was the way to go. Now suddenly they've disappeared. They were gated communities on the internet. Now, the, the, I'm sure the people here are saying, why should I put my resume up on Monster? I'll put it up on my, my account, my web page, mm -hmm. on LinkedIn or Facebook. The job should come and find me. Why should I go find a job? And so that's completely changed the paradigm here. So there are, it's a longer discussion, but there are at least you know, five to 10 important moves and trends taking place, place here that will yield you know, tomorrow's big companies in the workforce. Great, I'm gonna ask you afterwards what they are. <laughs> If you're the first mover, how can you avoid getting uprooted by your competitors? Uh, a first, a first mover. 
don't know if I have a, a general answer to it, but it's, uh, you know, you have to be the first mover with what you have determined is the final lasting solution for this problem. The it's biggest not first starter, it's first finisher. That's right. That's exactly well put. Uh, it is. It is who finishes. Who finishes, not who starts. Lots. You know, many are called. You know, few are chosen. You know, type of thing. So if you're the first mover, you have the burden of actually trying to figure out: is this the right solution, or is it simply a solution mm -hmm. in the marketplace? So the, the burden is even more to be developing insights, studying them, and you, you, know, you use your lead to gain insight, not to necessarily sell more product. Um, do you have any entrepreneurs that you really admire? It's the next question from the crowd. Uh, there, I mean, there's so there's so many out there. I don't. I tend to not uh, necessarily admire individuals because it's never the individual. There's always a big team behind them. But I admire business models, and I think of business models in two groups, or rather, this, the investors think of it in two groups. There's the there's the brave new world type of business model. Uh, that has never been done before, maybe an Amazon or an eBay type of thing. But most business models tend to be the other category, which is better, faster, cheaper. They're doing something either better or faster or cheaper. And uh, I admire people who have taken the time to actually figure out uh, how they can create a defensible position, you know, using one of these three, better, faster, cheaper. The other one, you know, you marvel at, but there's so much, there's so much luck involved in just creating something greenfield. It's what gets the press. But most companies are on the other side, on the left side. It's better, faster, cheaper. Got it. Um, so when someone approaches you, the next question is, when someone approaches you for advice on their startup, what makes you, what makes you interested in listening to them? Gets you excited about spending well, they, the time, they as would, busy as you are. They would, uh, actually, you're never too busy to talk to an excited person about their idea. It's, uh, it's, it's heady. It's... Uh, it, it feeds you in a sense. So if someone comes up and they're passionate about a space and they want to discuss that space, it's almost against your will you're drawn to them. That's what an entrepreneur does. They create this, they create a field. There'll be a line here afterwards, just so you know. So you will have. <laughs> Whoever brings me the next beer will get a, a chat there. No, but that's what it is. Uh, this, the, the, as an entrepreneur, your, your greatest gift is your the intensity of your commitment and your passion to the idea. And again, that only happens if you've been you know, stewing in it for a while. That's great. I think that's profound. Um, so how did you decide to first learn to code, and how has that benefited you? If you were a young person today, would, how important would you see that to be? Not important. And not important for the path that I took. But, uh, but a, a tremendous help if you want to be a technical founder. You have to have some skill. So, you know, as a young firm, what are you bringing to the table? Mm -hmm. If you... If you have a technical skill, then you have a clear domain, you know, at least for tech startups. Right. But if you don't, then you must have a command of, uh, of the business system. Because all elements of the business system, everything from pricing to supply, you know, all of those things, they all contain the possibility of creating differentiation. A moat can be created anywhere along this way. And really digging into the business system, how every part of it moves, how the money moves through this. Can I change it? Is this working? Whose pain point is it? Will they pay for to solve that pain point? You have to either bring that skill or some other skill. So before we go on, I've got two final questions I ask everybody. But um, you know, I think people are uh, two questions I wanted to ask here. One is um, people ask the question they know about your growth. Um, I don't think people realize where you are. So I have a question like, are you in the city or in the suburbs? Uh, and you have a tech center out, and I think. Will be yes and yes. Um, but so, talk about where your headquarters is. How many people are there? What kind of disciplines do you have? Where are you located? And then you're, you're outgrowing your space. Where do you think you move? Uh, so we're headquartered at uh, just north of the, the Willis Tower. Actually, it's Wacker and Adams. So it's the E Trade building. There's a big E Trade sign that hangs up. So we have a, a floor and a half there. Then we have a lot of space in Naperville. We've expanded there quite a bit. It's the big, the big train station building, and we'd actually. It took us a year or so to do this, but we maneuvered so that we were on the train line on both sides so we could get a for easy intraday commuting. So there's, uh, there's probably a couple of hundred people in the city here, in this office, wow. and uh, then, then quite a few in Naperville, too. And then we have a decent presence in Europe that just has grown organically because of the customer base there. Mm -hmm. Small presence in Australia, and then probably 80 people in India. 
And you'll plan on staying downtown? Oh yes, absolutely. It's been it's been great for us. The just the lifestyle, the the talent. Uh, I wouldn't consider moving, but we are we're we we are running out of space pretty rapidly. So you know, if we can't get that building to do something, we'll be looking elsewhere. Interesting. One last question from the crowd here uh, before I go the wrap ups we'd like to do here at Founder Stories. Um, for those of us considering business school, is it worth it? It's a very interesting question. Uh, it's a very good question. So I found my business school experience absolutely worth it. Uh, but then I can, I also know, so you know, I went to Kellogg. Uh, the, the problem back then, maybe even now, is that the business school starts to treat you like a customer instead of a student. Hmm. Now the burden is on you not to come in there and say, well, I'm paying you so much, so I can do whatever I want. So there were, there's always, you know, 10% of the people at any business school that have completely wasted their time and money, and therefore their life, their they're losers two or three times over by, by doing that. And they rely on the idea of, well, I've got this label and you know, some network, et cetera. But they don't have a, they, they might have a label, but the network can work against you too because it has bad memories of you because you didn't do anything. So on balance, I really got a lot out of business school because I treated it, you know, a lot of us treated it like a candy store. Mm -hmm. you know, learn as much as you could. And then if you go into consulting, it becomes like a little PhD in business. So if you do take that approach, and if you go at the right stage in your life, absolutely, I would recommend it. Uh, but it's uh, it's not it's not necessary. It's not necessary. There are schools of thought that say, you know, focus on the on, uh, you know, design or right brain type activities, fostering your creativity might be more useful in some ways. I'm not sure. I do. I did like business school. Uh, two last questions. Um, oh, sorry, three. One is, so one question that did come from the crowd I meant to ask earlier was, so talk a little bit about what you feel like it's like now, like you were at 1871, so many fantastic things happening uh, in the city overall. The CEC is a big part of this. You and I work with the CEC with Jim and the crowd. Uh, talk about now versus 2000. People who weren't here in 2000 or maybe were here but weren't in the tech community. Well, this it's completely different now. There's an, there's an energy, there's infrastructure, there are services offered up and so, uh, there are so many positives. You know, you can you don't feel like you're alone. It's collegial, etc. But I'll tell you, there's a potential negative to that, and it is that it has become almost too easy to start a company. You can register. So that's a controversial statement for a lot of people listening right now. So explain why. Help that's, break it down for them. That's what I'm here to do. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Uh, the risk, the risk, of course, is that an, an idea has such low stakes now. But you can throw up a copycat idea, you know, the, the, the next uh, company doing the same thing as someone else, and you can, you have tools available to create attractive, pretty products, and also raise a little bit of money. And uh, if, you, if one doesn't take the time to actually flesh out what problem it's solving or how it's differentiating, you know, all of the basic things, then it could be, you know, it could run for a while before the meeting its eventual fate, where those questions will be answered in the marketplace. So in that sense, and I'm not saying that this is happening, but I'm saying that is the danger of it becoming you know, too easy to start well, Fred, Fred Wilson has a great saying, which is, if you have an idea you can't stop obsessing about, start, right. found a company. If you don't, join a startup. If you want to be an entrepreneur. Right. World. I think that seems like good advice. Right. Um, if you had to do it over again, what would you say the pros and cons were of doing this in Chicago versus having moved to do it someplace else? I would do it in Chicago again, and it was much harder then. I think the biggest advantage is that it creates a less insane, there's a less insane, uh, you know, focus on things like stock options and exits and so on. And it, it creates an environment where you can actually build a company. It takes a while to build a good firm. It does. Out in, in other places, I, we just hear stories of how people are building it for an exit. What does that mean? Who's going to come to work for you if you're building it for an exit? You have to build it to solve a good problem and then, you know, monetization is a consequence of it, not, right. a, it's it's like, not an objective. It's like the scoreboard, right? You don't, you don't play the game for that. That's right. And uh, I, I really like Chicago for that. I think there's a ton of talent here. Certain types of skills are a little hard to get. You know, technical marketing skills, this, they're not that present here. At least they weren't back then. Uh, but all other skills, uh, they're plentiful. And it's a great city to, to live in. To live in, of course. Well, you know, you've, you've been a great part of making our tech community here. 
Um, one question I ask at the final question of every uh, Founder Stories interview, which is, you're a great entrepreneur, you've had some liquidity, you, you know, you've built a legendary uh, business here in Chicago. As you work with younger, newer companies, um, ones you've been exposed to where you maybe met the founders or, you know, uh, know the founders or invested in or worked with, anybody you're close enough to, to know, um, what can you tell, tell us about who you're excited about? What are the ones that you think might be sitting up here someday? There are so many of them. Some, some I've actually made small investments in because they are friends of mine, other, others I haven't. And uh, the, the things I use, for instance, you know, the, 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 the taxi service, Uber, it's just, they, there's a simplicity, ease of use. I have no you know, connection to them. I just enjoy using them. Or Grubhub, again, I have no connection, but I, 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 I use it a lot. And it becomes, you know, it becomes part of what you do. Yeah, Matt and uh, Mike are great. They were our, our inaugural I, guests here. They were, they were there. Sure. Or uh, uh, Cardiby which I thought was a really cool idea. You know, Paul Cozier, who started it, was one of our first employees, actually, oh, cool. a few glass years later. And when I heard he was involved, uh, you know, I, I said, I don't know anything about what they do, but it's going to be the best-looking you know, product. It was recently sold to yeah. DocuSign. They were our first opening act. First time we had opening acts, they were here, and they were in negotiations, and they said, I can't tell anybody. Right. But uh, it's exciting. Real, really interesting problem, real estate documents. It's, uh, it's very interesting. I like... Uh, uh, Parkways, you know, they're one of several are solving a, a in, interesting capacity, you know, sort of a expiring asset problem in the parking space, or uh, what Jeff, my, my my friend Jeff Hyman's doing with retrofit. You know, that's very glad I'm not a candidate to use his uh, weight loss service, but uh, I think his tagline of the, the wealthy but unhealthy is is, is great. It's great positioning, so I hope he does well. There are a number of others, but those come to mind. That's for great. Now. Well, this has been a treasure trove of insights. I'm going to be a better entrepreneur tomorrow because of it. Thank you so much for sharing with James. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.